Um, this talk is about orchestration and specifically all the stuff that you think that you know, but you probably kind of don't know. Um, I have been using Docker for a long time, long before orchestration was really part of the story. So my first Docker version was 070 in late 2013. Um, I've been working with Docker for so long, they have given me a fancy hat and the title of Docker captain. So if you're brand new to Docker, which probably you're not if you're in this room, please seek out me or someone else who's a Docker captain. We'd be happy to chat with you. Um, as Jerome mentioned, I'm the director of engineering at CodeChip which is a CI CD company. I'm not gonna talk about CI CD, but we do have a booth here if you are interested in Docker, CI CD, writing tests, not being paged, um, all those things we can talk to you about at our booth. Um, I think we're S5 in the expo hall, so come, come say hi. We have hot sauce. Um, it's, it's good hot sauce. It's TSA approved hot sauce. Um, so today, as Jerome mentioned, as I mentioned, we're talking about orchestration. So we'll talk about the Raft algorithm. We're going to talk about quorum, leader election, log replication. I'll talk a bit about service scheduling and strategies for scheduling um, tasks, how they get dispatched onto your cluster. And then for my last tricks, we will go over some pretty gnarly failure recovery scenarios. Um, I have a lot of live demos, um, I think six of them. And I'm feeling, you know, this is not, this is black belt. This is like not recommended use necessarily of what you should be using Docker for. So um, bear with me. I, um, I will, I'll do everything live because otherwise it's cheating. Um, throughout the talk, I'll have some debugging tips that you might find useful if you're trying to figure out what's going on in your cluster. Um, so the whole reason that orchestration is so complex and why we're all sitting in this room is that what we're trying to do is to get this like big collection of nodes to behave like a single node. So to the outside user, it should just seem like you're talking only to one computer. And the way that this can happen kind of boils down to two main categories. We have um, maintaining state in the system. So in order to behave like one single thing, there has to be a single state. How does that happen? And then also, how does work get scheduled? If you say Docker service create something, how does the orchestrator and the scheduler decide where to dispatch um, those tasks so that they are running on a node that can handle the workload? Um, pretty much state and scheduling are the two big problems, and everything that we'll talk about today kind of boils down in one of those two categories. Before we get too deep into it, um, of course this is a beautiful cluster and we're all familiar with what this looks like. For the next 35 minutes or so, I'm mostly gonna talk about managers in orange. I'm gonna talk about raft consensus and the consensus group. We'll talk about leaders and followers and the management group, but I'm not really gonna talk much about um, the workers themselves or the interface between managers and workers. Most of the heavy lifting in a cluster happens at the manager level and I think that's the most important stuff, so we'll focus there. And the number one most important thing that you need to understand in order for your um, highly available services to stay highly available and for things not to just turn upside down is quorum. So what even is quorum? I took a sample poll at the CodeChip customer dinner last night and got a lot of like, oh, yeah, it's, uh, I understand it. Um, so that leads me to believe that maybe some of you who are administering clusters in this room might not totally understand what quorum is, but it is essential and imperative that you do. Quorum, just like in the legislative kind of political sense, is the minimum number of votes that a group needs in order to perform an operation. So in distributed systems, this is scheduling something, promoting a node to become uh, a new leader, like electing that node. If you do not have quorum, your system cannot do work. So you need to plan to maintain quorum in your consensus group at all times. This can be done with math, which is really fortunate for all of us. Um, the the, the um, formula is a little bit weird because of course you can't have like half of a manager. We have to deal in whole numbers. So if you have a consensus group of five, it's like five divided by two plus one, that's quorum. So in that, that case it's three. Um, round down in this case, take the floor of that number. If you have one manager, quorum is one. If you have two managers, quorum is two, um, and so on and so forth. This is, can be achieved with math. Um, in simpler terms, quorum means majority. And of course, when uh, um, we're talking about nodes that are online and able to vote in, in the cluster of your manager group. I think what's more important than understanding quorum is understanding how much fault your system can tolerate. So in the case of one manager, quorum is one, you have zero. Um, but in the case of two, quorum is also two because one out of two is not more than n divided by two plus one. No, your fault tolerance is still zero. And in fact, even numbers of managers are highly inefficient and please don't do them. Like, please don't use even numbers. Use odd numbers only. Like, 
the phrase I literally can't even, like it's kind of annoying, but that is a good rule for your management cluster, just only odd numbers. Having two managers instead of one, this is so counterintuitive, but when I say it like this, you're gonna think, oh my God, Laura, you just blew my mind. Having two managers instead of one actually doubles your chances for losing quorum. It actually makes your management cluster more unstable. You have two points of failure instead of one. Please don't do it. Just have one, have three, have five, um, even, or sorry, odd numbers only. Don't use even numbers. If you are using multiple regions or doing something really distributed across the world, pay attention to data center topology when you're placing management, uh, manager nodes. Um, plan that one of your data centers, <laughs> US East One, is gonna go on fire and that you're not gonna know about it. Um, by the way, all of my demos are in US East One, so <laughs> I probably should have like rubbed that plastic skull or something before I came up here, but. Um, <laughs> so if you're distributing, for example, three nodes across three regions, have one node in each region, pretty in intuitive. Plan to have one region totally blown away and still maintain quorum. This again can be done with math. Um, in Docker for AWS, this is done automatically for you via auto-scaling groups. Um, auto-scaling groups on AWS kind of distribute the work for you, so use them if you can. Enough about Quorum. Quorum is just one part of the story. Raft is the thing that's like using this idea of Quorum and making your system run. So Raft is really complex, and we talk about Raft, we talked about it in the keynote. Um, no sensible person wants to write their own distributed consensus algorithm. That's why Raft is used, because why would you write your own? Um, you can write your own implementation, but the actual algorithm itself is not worth you writing your own. Just use the one that's, uh, that's out there. So Raft is responsible for a couple things. It's responsible for log replication in your cluster. It is responsible for leader election, and it is responsible for safety. So making sure that nothing too terrible can happen or making sure that your cluster doesn't get into a terrible state. I'm not gonna talk much about safety. It's sort of built into the log and leader part of, um, of what the protocol is responsible for. Being easier to understand is an kind of un, uh, unwritten responsibility of Raft. The whole point we're talking about Raft instead of something like Paxos or Multipaxos is because no one understands Multipaxos. Um, I could not stand up here and give you a talk on how Multipaxos works because I couldn't even explain it to you very eloquently. Um, this is a problem for people who are administering distributed systems. If you don't understand the algorithm that is backing your entire management cluster, um, that's like a big red flag. So Raft was designed to be a bit more easy, uh, to be a bit easier to understand, easier to teach, easier for students to learn. Um, which is great for you all because then it's easier for you to understand as well. Chances are, even if you don't use SwarmKit or even if today is the first time you've ever heard of Raft, you've probably used it before. It's used everywhere that etcd is used because etcd is backed by Raft. Orchestration systems need some kind of consensus algorithm to back um, them when they're running and in a lot of cases that algorithm is Raft. So if you're using Kubernetes, if you're using etcd, um, you are using Raft already, maybe you just don't know about it. The difference about SwarmKit is that SwarmKit implements Raft directly. SwarmKit does not use etcd, it just has Raft um, hanging out there on GitHub. You can check it out, read it, it's lots of comments. I highly recommend that you do that. In most cases, so Raft is running on your manager nodes. Raft takes up a lot of resources to do the work that it needs to do to keep your cluster up and running. I would highly recommend not running work on your manager nodes. Um, this maybe seems like cluster 101, um, but I think a lot of people forget you can drain um, your manager nodes by using docker node update dash dash availability drain. This will make sure that no work gets scheduled on the manager nodes. It's also great to have the manager nodes be a bit bigger than, uh, than your worker nodes simply because Raft does take up a lot of resources and the nodes that are running the algorithm can be a bit more sensitive to resource starvation maybe than a normal worker node. Um, I will of course run work on manager nodes um, for educational purposes only. So if you are of course a hobbyist, maybe it's fine to run work on manager nodes. Um, just a word of warning to, to not do that. You can prevent really bad things from happening if you just keep your manager nodes for Raft only and not for other tasks. Let's talk a bit about what Raft is doing under the covers. Um, so this is leader election and, and log replication. And we're gonna talk about leader election first. So we know that we have a leader um, in our manager cluster. And the manager can also be in a candidate state, meaning it's trying to be elected leader, or it can be in a follower state, meaning it's just like voting and taking instructions from the leader. There's sort of a fourth unwritten um, 
state, which is offline. This is like what we're trying to protect ourselves against is having a manager offline and then everything blows up in our face. I have a handy demo. Um, of course, I have a domain name hoarding addiction, so I did buy the domain consensus.group. So if you go to demo.consensus.group, um, we can look at the cool demo. Um, let me see if I can hide this and go there. Um, we can just talk through what's happening. So first we'll talk about, um, maybe I can make this a little bigger. Um, we can talk about the leader election process. I'm gonna speed this up just so that I can save more room for live demos at the end. Um, so what just happened there is we started a new election cycle. Um, and in this case, number two, so S2 has be just been elected the leader and has this solid line around it. Um, around the other nodes, we notice their timeout. And what will happen is if none of the nodes hear from the leader before those nodes time out, um, that timeout will prompt a new election cycle. So in this case, S3 was the first to time out. It started a new election phase. We have one node offline. That node can't vote, but that's okay because we have five, which means quorum is three. So we have four votes. The candidate votes for itself. And then three was allowed to be elected the leader. Raft has some pretty cool stuff. Um, and one of the really cool things it does and why you shouldn't write your own consensus algorithm <laughs> is because of weird cases like this, like an actual very um, true split vote. In this case, we had S1 and S5 um, timed out at exactly the same time. This is really, really unlikely because these timeouts are randomized, but it can happen like in the realm of the universe of possibilities. Um, keeping in mind we have five manager nodes, quorum is Three, we maybe are gonna end up in a bad state because each of these nodes is trying to get three votes. We only have four online and it didn't happen. Um, ooh, and we lost it. So what happened was that neither of them got the three votes necessary and Raft, instead of trying to repair that election cycle, just says like, ugh, whatever. The next node that times out without hearing that a new leader has been elected becomes the new candidate and then we ended up in, um, in the fifth election term. So that's leader election. It's actually pretty simple to understand, relatively speaking. It's the, the logging part that's a bit more challenging. Um, before we go through the logging demo, I just wanna make something really, really clear. So number one, the log is the source of truth for your application. This is, um, if you imagine like a series of scribes distributed across many ancient cities, the scribe has like stone tablets of the truth written on it, and that's what the log is in the case of your distributed system. I am not talking about things that you read in paper trail. I am not talking about stack traces or application, any like output. Um, I'm talking about an append only time-based record of data. Um, in this case, we can ex uh, think for example, we have a log of the value of x. We start on the left-hand side with the first entry, x gets two, x gets 10, 30, et cetera. And we're just appending entries. So this is time-based, append only, just it's the truth, it's the state of your application. Distributed logs um, and replicated logs are how your distributed system knows about its state. This log is for computers, it is not for humans. So again, this is not things that you would read in paper trail or like log aggregation of the services that are running in your distributed system. This is the record that is the truth. Um, any new node that has this log should behave in the same state. Um, again, this is for computers, not humans, but I am a human with a computer, so we will do some fun demos in just a bit. Um, the thing about logs and distributed systems is that um, it's kind of hard. So this is a very simple system. We have a client and a server. Of course, the client can say, hey, server X gets 12, and then the server is like, cool, and it gets added to the log, and it's not a big deal. Um, as you can maybe imagine, the idea of quorum becomes important when trying to replicate logs to a distributed group. Um, all of these managers have to vote and agree that the next state transition is possible and valid and vote to accept the change so that it can be appended. Um, we can go back to my fancy little demo here. Um, so this is five manager nodes, the same ones that we had before, and we'll just go through log replication. Um, we can see that S1, who's the current leader, has some uncommitted logs, that's why there's dashes around them, and it tr it's trying to write them into stone, per se, trying to commit them, but we have three offline nodes, which means we do not have quorum, which means that cannot happen. We can't perform that operation because we don't have quorum. So the system will just do what it can without quorum. Um, 
Once a new node comes online, you can see, maybe it's a little hard to see in the back, but those logs in the leader are now being committed. So they're, they're being voted on, accepted as truth, and then we can proceed. And that's exactly what happens until they're all committed. Um, what happens though, like let's say for example we have uncommitted logs and then the leader times out and we have an election and then now we're in a new election cycle. Um, the kind of long story short is that logs from a more recent election term take precedent. So we're in term three now um, and we'll see like when S1 comes back online, it will just listen to whatever is there from the more recent election. So. Um, of course, this is like a pretty, not watered down, but like some pretty simple, convenient examples that are nice and can be visualized here. Um, there's a lot more complexity that's, um, you know, worth its own two hour talk um, or worth its own advanced orchestration workshop, um, perhaps at Velocity in June if you're there. Um, you, can learn, <laughs> you can learn even more all about this. Um, cool. Please understand log replication. Again, I could go on for like two hours about this. There's a really good blog post that I made a convenient bit.ly link, bit.ly logging post. It's from the LinkedIn engineering team. It talks at length about what logs are, where they come from, what they're used for. Please do yourself a favor if you're administering a cluster and read this blog post. You can thank me later on Twitter. Um, great. So one cool debugging tip, we talked about these logs and I said that they're not for humans, but I'm a human with a computer, so let's see what's actually going on here because I think it's really useful to like look at what's happening in the file system. Um, I have, so there's two ways that you can kind of see what's going on in your cluster. One is monitoring the logs via something like I notify wait, or you can read them directly. So um, let's start with, um, let's start with the uh, monitoring uh, let's see. So I have a cluster here. Um, I have, I think, Docker node ls three. I have node one, which is the leader, and then I have two other nodes um, chilling. So I'm going to do my work on node one, and then on node two here, I'm just going to monitor the logs in the file system. Um, they live in varlib docker swarm. And I made, of course, a little image because it's easier for me to remember this like um, docker run command versus the I notify wait command because those are harder to remember. So, um, <laughs> so let's just link varlib um, docker swarm into this container. And I made this little which is just gonna watch Varlib Docker Swarm. Um, cool, so we have a watch set up. Um, I'm gonna go back onto node one in my cluster and we'll run that fancy example voting app that we are all very familiar with from all the various keynotes. Um, I'm gonna run that with Docker stack deploy because there's a stack file in it. Um, we'll call it vote and we can say Docker stack. Cool, so we're gonna create a bunch of networks, create a bunch of services, and then, ha ha, my plan worked. So we can actually see that we have some action going on here in um, varlib docker swarm raft, the WAL, that's the log, so we can see that it's like being modified, we can see tasks are being modified, um, all this good stuff is happening here, which is pretty sweet. Um, cool, but what happens if like, you just wanna look at what's happening in the log. So I mentioned this is not for computers. Um, and it's not, but there is a tool in SwarmKit that helps you kind of dump the logs out and look at what's going on in case you need them for debugging purposes. Um, so I have made conveniently just a little backups um, directory. And then I just ran a Docker container with the Golang image and mount go bin from the, the container to get the utilities that are in Docker SwarmKit CMD. Um, I just loaded those in there for demo purposes, they're already done. And what we can do is, for safety reasons, take a copy of the file system. I'm gonna put that in here. So um, let's sudo cpa var, let's see, lib, 
Docker swarm. Um, let's call this swarm copy. Um, cool. So I have now the swarm copy, which is the, like, where my logs were. What we were just monitoring, I just put in here. Um, we have to do a bit of fancy work with sudo, which is always good during a live demo. Um, so that I can access them. Swarm copy. Cool. And then we can use the swarm raft tool point it at swarm copy, um, and then use this utility called dump, W-A-L, like, um, I actually forget what that stands for, write only, write append log, yeah? Ugh, this is our raft log. So this is like human readable version of what's happening in our cluster, and you can see there's like lots of stuff going on in there. Um, if we, look just a bit, we can see that this is like all the events, the record from our voting app. Um, they're all there. We can see entry index, we can see the election terms, we can see a lot of stuff. Um, I'm not gonna say that this is like a very practical thing for you to do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it can be done, and the utility lives in SwarmKit itself. So this is a nice way to kind of to have a, a deeper look into what's actually going on in your, um, in your cluster. Cool, so that's swarm, logs. Um, let's talk a bit about scheduling. So scheduling is a bit tricky because um, scheduling algorithms that you're taught in CS classes are kind of for like packing boxes at Amazon warehouses. It's not really for running highly available applications. And there's just a subset of problems where those two things, HA applications and scheduling algorithms sort of overlap. And that's um, the problems that orchestrators have to deal with. As we talked about, um, I think Diogo mentioned it this morning in the, uh, in the opening session, there are scheduling constraints. So he used the example of scheduling um, secure, like work that really needs secure nodes on like the subset that has a specific label. You can do that with dash dash constraint. Um, you can use labels. You can use a bunch of other stuff. It's really well documented. Um, this makes it so that you can only run that work on the node that has the constraint. Brand new in Docker 1704 is topology-aware scheduling. So this is not a constraint, but a preference. Um, what this does is implements a spread strategy, so trying to spread the work out over the nodes evenly for nodes that belong to a certain category. Unlike constraint, this is a soft preference, so if it can't be satisfied, the scheduler is gonna still try to run your work somewhere else. Um, it's not as hard as constraint. Um, you can't get into a state where, um, like, a job is scheduled and it really shouldn't have been allowed to be scheduled. Um, it's a soft preference, so you have to know the difference um, when you're using it. And um, we can maybe take a look at that really quickly. Um, I'm in a Docker stack RM, this uh, vote stack. And actually, I have um, on consensus.group the Docker Swarm Visualizer in case you want like a, a more UI focused um, picture of what's happening here. I'm gonna add some labels to my nodes using docker node update, dash dash label add, which is really kind of counterintuitive from an English speaking perspective. Um, I'm gonna add the label data center, DC, and for node one and node two, I'll put them in the same data center, for example. Um, node three, let's put it in this data center. So um, what now we have are two nodes in one data center, another node in another data center. When I do a Docker service create, um, let's just run some Redis stuff. And let's run like, let's run 12 of them to start with. I'm gonna start them with a placement pref. And that is going to be spread, that's the strategy. Node, labels, Data, data center, okay. Um, this is gonna say for every value, I have two values of data center, it's gonna spread the work evenly, so we can expect six to be scheduled in A and six to be scheduled in Z. We have one node in Z and two in A, so we'll see what the, um, what the scheduler does there. I think that should work. Um, let's take a peek over here. Cool, so we can see that 
For the values of A, it took those jobs and then split them up over the two nodes. Um, and then in the value of Z, since there's only one node, it's gonna schedule all six. This is a really good way to, again, prevent single point of failure with a particular data center. Um, again, if, in case one goes down, you can kind of make sure that your highly available apps are highly available. One super cool um, point that I wanna make is that um, if you are like <laughs> running stuff and one of your nodes goes offline, um, your nodes, of course, this, the, the tasks are gonna be rescheduled. Um, I have a pretty fancy chaos monkey script, so let's, um, let's disconnect one of the nodes. Maybe node two can be disconnected. Um, so we'll drop all network traffic, like what could go wrong, um, to node two. This might just take a little bit for the visualizer to pick up the change that it's going to drop. Okay, cool, so now we can see Oh, I asked for how many, cool. It's gonna split it up then. So it took the nodes, I had a placement preference in data center A, one of the nodes in data center A went down, so it's gonna reschedule that work on the other node that's available in data center A. One thing that is maybe a bit counterintuitive is that when that node comes back online, there's really no point in taking healthy nodes offline, so let's not do it. Um, or sorry, not healthy nodes, healthy jobs. So right now, what you might expect is for Swarm to rebalance that node, but it's not going to. Everything's just gonna stay where it is unless the containers go down, and then they'll be redispatched onto maybe node two. But this is a um, kind of counterintuitive thing to you maybe expect some rebalancing, but it will not happen. Um, what will happen in terms of um, kind of rebalancing is you can do a manual rebalancing. You can maybe say Docker service scale um, Redis equals 20. We can add some and then maybe take it back down to 12. Okay, so this is like a manual workaround. It's not like ideal. Um, but if, if rebalancing is really important to you, that's what you have to do. It won't happen automatically for you. Cool. Debugging tip for scheduling is um, add availability drain to a manager node and run that engine in debug mode. That will help you if you're kind of confused about some of the scheduling things that are going on. Yes, adding another manager to your cluster will maybe disrupt the like um, failure safety for ha maintaining quorum, but chances are if you have to run a manager in debug mode with availability drain, you probably have bigger problems. So I think it's fine just for this one case. Um, cool, so we talked about just a really easy kind of failure recovery, what happens when a single node goes down? Those things are, um, the jobs are just sort of scheduled onto the other nodes that can accommodate them. Um, but what happens when like more disastrous things happen? So um, let's talk about losing quorum and what happens when you lose quorum. So again, you're, um, you just like simply can't do work on your cluster if you've lost quorum. The most obvious thing is to bring back the nodes that are down, like duh, right? Um, obviously that's probably not the case. Um, if you lose quorum, if you have access to a healthy manager, you can run docker swarm init dash dash force new cluster. That will recreate the cluster with one manager that's the healthy manager that you're on. You need to then promote other managers to get to the kind of group that you want. If you wanted five, so now you force a new cluster with only one new manager. But it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty okay kind of Failure recovery, it's a pretty soft failure recovery. Like nothing too disastrous has happened. Um, but what happens if the data center is just totally on fire? Um, you can restore from a backup your whole cluster. Um, I can say this is recommended and in case, it like it really shouldn't happen, but this is black belt, so I'm gonna do things that are you know not recommended um, and things that really shouldn't happen. Um, th this is in the docs and I wanna just talk through a couple like complexity, like pieces of complexity around this. So um, basically the process is this. You have a backup. So you have var lib docker swarm backed up somewhere. Um, you wanna bring a new node online and stop docker. It is possible to do this like a hot kind of backup and like a hot restore, but for your own sake, just don't do it. Don't try to have docker changing the state when you're trying to re recover from a backup. Same for when you take the backup, just stop docker. Um, 
make sure that varlib docker swarm is totally cleaned out. So you can do a sudo rmrf, which is my favorite way of ensuring nothing is there. Copy your backup into varlib docker swarm, start docker, and then you can do a docker swarm in it, just like when you lost quorum. Um, and you can use dash dash force new cluster. I have it in parentheses because in fact, just yesterday, um, or maybe the day before yesterday, I found what is arguably a bug, but arguably also a feature in this recovery process. Um, so if you have a backup, the metadata for your nodes has the IP address of the leader, okay? In general, you should not be monkeying around with the IP addresses of your nodes, and in fact, it's like expressly forbidden in the context of Swarm. When you restore from a backup, you are kind of giving your cluster that old state and that old IP address, which means when you try to generate a token and join the Swarm, like it's not gonna work because the Swarm leader is advertising itself on a different IP than is there, right? Um, this is arguably a feature to protect yourself like from disastrous, but in this one particular case of restoring from a backup, it's less than ideal. Um, one workaround is to use an elastic IP um, and just like reassign that IP to the new node that you bring up. Eh. Um, you have to know that beforehand. So that's why I'm here to tell you <laughs> if like this is not ideal and in fact like I just haven't gotten around to opening up the issue on, uh, on Docker because I, I wanna do a little bit more documentation since I'm a good issue opener. Um, but like, I'm not sure how this is gonna work out, so I'll show you the workaround, um, and I'll show you like what might happen if you try to restore from a backup right now as it is um, written in the docs. So I'm gonna um, do that now. This is my last trick. Um, cool, so let's, let's say we want 20 uh, of these Redis containers. Okay, cool. Um, I am gonna use S3 for my backup because it's just like, it's just ones and zeros. You of course could have this in a volume. You could do any number of things. Um, I'm gonna just copy it up there. Bear with me as I type. Take a drink of water, do, do something else. Don't check your email, I promise it won't take too long. Um, bar lid, Docker, Swarm. Um, I'm gonna dump this into Docker Swarm backups, I think that should work. Cool. So pretty much everything that we saw being monitored is I'm just like gonna dump it somewhere else. Um, this is not a talk on like how to use S3 or how to use AWS properly or even how to make a backup, so it's just gonna be there. <laughs> um, the important thing is I, I have it somewhere else. Um, and I'm gonna close out the connection to like Again, I have to change, I have to reallocate uh, or reassociate my floating IP to the new cluster. Um, again, this is not a talk on how to use the AWS CLI, so for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with AWS, I'm just gonna use the UI and disassociate my floating IP address. When I started this cluster, I'm advertising on this elastic IP. I think that's the most important detail that maybe I left out. Um, you have to not only assign the elastic IPs to your managers, but you have to advertise using that Elastic IP because that's the piece of information that's gonna be carried to your new cluster. Um, dun, dun, dun. Let's see. Let's see if this will work, okay, cool. I want to then, um, I'm gonna reassociate this to, to the main kind of node one in my new cluster. Um, I'm gonna try to SSH into this again, so of course I'm gonna get a terrible warning, which is fun, I'll fix that. Cool, uh, awesome. So I should, in theory, now be able to SSH into this other instance. Oh. again, yes. Excellent. Um, I have nothing running on this, and in fact, if you wanna go onto consensus.group, we, um, we should see also nothing running on this. Cool, there's nothing 
happening. Um, as I said before, the most important thing is to um, stop the Docker service, and I'm just gonna do that via systemctl. Cool, um, if I do Docker info, I should get nothing. Great, okay, now I need to somehow get my offline backup onto this machine, um, and I'm gonna do that. First, I'm gonna sudo rm rf varlib docker swarm to make sure. Um, let's check what's in there. Okay, totally nothing's in there, cool. Um, sudo AWS. I promise this will all be worth it for the magical reveal at the end. Um, dun, 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 var with Docker. Oh. No such bucket. Yeah, cool, okay, cool. So I'm just copying bits from one place to the other, and now if we look here, we should have Swarm in place. Cool. Um, now we have to start the cluster. Um, are we, sorry, we have to start Docker first. So it's again so important to not have Docker running during this whole time because like you don't want two things trying to do the same thing at the same time. Um, start Docker service. Just give it a minute. All right. Cool. Docker service LS. All right. Um, Let's see, nothing should be running right now, and I should be able to say docker swarm init dash force new cluster. I hope. <laughs> so in order, like full transparency, um, I have done this demo probably 10 or 12 times, and it's only worked maybe 50% of the time. Um, <laughs> because of like, it's again, not recommended. Okay, great, so now I have this error that I've lost quorum, um, which is not ideal. Um, yeah, of course it's not a manager, but I'm trying to force new cluster. Let's try this again, and if not, I'll resort to showing you the recording, which is very upsetting. Um, okay, cool, womp womp. This is real life. Um, Let's fast forward to the end of this. We'll pretend. Cool, wow, amazingly, I just downloaded everything from S3 and look at it go. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's uh, do this and then I'll check to see what I did wrong because uh, I probably did something wrong, which is fine. Um, Cool, sorry, maybe this is a little bit hard to see, but um, at this point I've taken the backup and I'm just gonna start the Docker service again. This works, so Docker should be running. Um, and in this case, because I have exactly the same IP, I didn't even have to force a new cluster. Um, the swarm just thought like, hey, cool, that's awesome. Um, and if I go to the visualizer, everything that I had running before is there. But you'll notice like with a big kind of caveat, um, and again, I wanna make it really clear like this is number one, like not recommended, um, and you should never be in a state where you have to do this. And number two, there is an issue with, um, right now with IP address and being able to seamlessly transfer a file system backup um, into a new cluster. So this is not something that 
ideally you should be, you find yourself in the situation in production, um, you should have um, something in place like monitoring or something so that someone gets paged before this happens. I just wanna illustrate that it is like technically possible, all the stuff that's running um, underneath your cluster, it's just a bunch of ones and zeros and you can move data around and kind of restore from a backup. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it obviously doesn't work that great. Um, there's so much more interesting, um, very advanced orchestration topics that I didn't cover. I didn't talk about security. I didn't talk about um, running Swarm at scale. I highly suggest that you seek out those talks because I think they're, they're super, super interesting. Um, if this was way over your head, I highly encourage you to um, attend one of the advanced orchestration workshops, um, usually that Jerome runs. They're quite good. Um, that is all. Um, thank you all so much. Um, because we're out of time, we won't do Q&A, but uh, like a formal all group Q&A, but please come up if you have a question, otherwise stop at, sorry, stop by the code chip booth and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, thank since so there's a break just after, uh, you're welcome to hang out here and ask questions. Thanks again, Nora.